Chapter 20 My dear Wormwood, I note with great displeasure that the enemy has, for the time being, put a forcible end to your direct attacks on the patient's chastity. You ought to have known he always does in the end. You ought to have stopped before you reached that stage. For as things are, your man has now discovered the dangerous truth that these attacks don't last forever and consequently you cannot use against what is, after all, our best weapon, the belief of ignorant humans that there is no hope of getting rid of us, except by yielding to us. I suppose you've tried persuading him that uh, chastity is unhealthy. Hmm. I haven't yet got a report from you on the young women in the neighborhood. I should like it at once. For if we can't use his sexuality to make him unchaste, we must try to use it for promotion of a desirable marriage. In the meantime, I would like to give you some hint about the type of woman, I mean the physical type, which he should be encouraged to fall in love with, if uh, falling in love is the best that we can manage. In a rough and ready way, of course, this question is decided for us by spirits far deeper down in the lower archy than you and I. It is the business of these great masters to produce in every age a general misdirection of what may be called sexual taste. They do this by working through the small circle of popular artists, dressmakers, actresses, and advertisers who determine the fashionable type. The aim is to guide each sex away from those members of the other with whom spiritually helpful, happy, and fertile marriages are most likely. Thus, we have now for many centuries triumphed over nature to the extent of making uh, certain secondary characteristics of the male, such as the beard, disagreeable to nearly all the females. And there is more in that than you might suppose. As regards the male taste, we have varied a good deal. At one time, we have directed it to the statuesque and aristocratic type of beauty, mixing men's vanity with their desires and encouraging the race to breed chiefly the most arrogant and prodigal women. At another, we have selected an exaggeratedly feminine type, faint and languishing, so that folly and cowardice and all the general falseness and littleness of mind which go with them shall be at a premium. At present, we are on the opposite tack. The age of jazz has succeeded the age of waltz, and we now teach men to like women whose bodies are scarcely distinguishable from those of boys. Since this is a kind of beauty even more transitory than most, we thus aggravate the female's chronic horror of growing old, with many excellent results, and render her less willing and less able to bear children. And that is not all. We have engineered a great increase in the license which society allows to the representation of the apparent nude, uh, not the real nude, in art and its exhibition on the stage or on the bathing beach. It is all fake, of course. The figures in popular art are falsely drawn. The real women in bathing suits or tights are actually pinched in and propped up to make them appear firmer and more slender and more boyish than nature allows a full-grown woman to be. Yet, at the same time, the modern world is taught to believe it is being frank and healthy and getting back to nature. <laughs> As a result, we are more and more directing the desires of men to something which does not exist making the role of the eye in sexuality more and more important, and, at the same time, making its demands more and more impossible. What follows, you can easily forecast. That is the general strategy of the moment. But, inside that framework, you will still find it possible to encourage your patient's desires in one of two directions. 
you will find, if you look carefully in any man's heart, that he is haunted by at least two imaginary women, a terrestrial and an infernal Venus, and that his desire differs qualitatively according to its object. There is one type for which his desire is such as to be naturally amenable to the enemy, readily mixing with charity, readily obedient in marriage, colored all through with that golden light of reverence and naturalness which we detest. There is another type which he desires brutally, and desires to desire brutally, a type best used to draw him away from marriage altogether, but which, even within marriage, would tend to treat as a slave, an idol, or an accomplice. His love for the first might involve what the enemy calls evil, but only accidentally. The man would wish that she was not someone else's wife, and be sorry that he could not love her lawfully. But in the second type, the felt evil is what he wants. It is that tang in the flavor which he is after. In the face, it is the visible animality, or sulkiness, or craft, or cruelty, which he likes, and in the body, something quite different from what he ordinarily calls beauty, something he may even, in a sane hour, describe as ugliness, but which, by our art, can be made to play on the raw nerve of his private obsession. The real use of the infernal Venus is, no doubt, as prostitute or mistress. But if your man is a Christian, and if he has been well-trained in nonsense about irresistible and all-excusing love, he can often be induced to marry her. And that is very well worth bringing about. You will have failed, regards to fornication and solitary vice, but there are other and more indirect methods of using a man's sexuality to his undoing. And, by the way, they are not only efficient, but delightful. The unhappiness produced is of a very lasting and exquisite kind. Your affectionate uncle, Screwtape.